Sejun O says, Oh, hi everybody, Adam Savage here in my cave answering questions from tested patrons. And Sejun O says, hello from Korea. Well, hello, Korea. Uh, he says, or she says, I'm not really sure. Uh, I read Every Tool's Hammer recently and it changed my way of thinking about myself and the way to go in so many special ways. It's so lovely. Then I got curious about what books you remember reading that changed your way of thought in special ways. If you have some, I would really like to read those too. That's a lovely question. Because yeah, uh, and the way you've phrased it is terrific. Because you haven't asked for like, what's your favorite book? You've asked for books that changed the way I thought. So the first one that comes to mind is a book called um, The Design of Everyday Things. Hmm. My God, uh, hang on just a second. Um, yeah, so I forgot the name of the author, Donald A. Norman. The Design of Everyday Things is a absolutely critical book. It is super, super important. This is the book that taught me this super important life lesson which is when you are approaching two glass doors and you can't tell whether they push out or go in, it is not your fault. It is the fault of the designer. When you can't figure out how something works, it's not your fault. The designer didn't take your experience into account. Now, this isn't a universal truth. There's all sorts of ways in which we can be dumb about how things work, certainly, to be sure. But what the design of everyday things really walks you through is the idea that design is about telling a story. See the throughput for me? Everything is about telling a story. So in design, when you're designing a door, you can actually help tell the story of whether it pushes out or whether it pulls in. You put handles on one side. That tells me that maybe I want to pull. You can put arrows. There's signage. There's indicators you can use that help people to understand. And knowing what story you're telling with design is the most critical part of being a designer. When you see a designer like, okay, so this, I designed this, right? Sure, I put it together, I designed it. Um, let's say that its function is really important to me. I might like hold it back and just see, does it, can I really see, can I really, how clearly do I understand what's going on? What I'm doing is I'm, I'm wondering about its ability to quickly tell me the story that I want it to tell. So when I'm designing a prop, when I'm designing a spaceship, for instance, and I'm adding in little details, each one of those details is helping to tell the story. The design I am using for putting details on is altered by the story that I want to tell. So the design of everyday things is a absolutely critical book for any kind of designer in any medium there is. Um, that was a really important book. The Inner Game of Tennis by Tim Galloway, Timothy Galloway. Uh, I found this book, okay, way back in the, in the 80s, I played pool and billiards pretty seriously. Not very seriously, pretty seriously. I played for a couple of hours a day for several years. And I amassed a, uh, I still have it, a uh, over 100 volume library of books about billiards going back to the eight, 19th century, the late 19th century. Um, and by the way, the best book ever written on pool is Burns, Standard Book of Pool and Billiards. Robert Byrne, is it Robert Byrne? I think it's Robert Byrne. It's actually up in Marin, or was up in Marin. Um, the seminal textbook on playing pool and billiards. That one totally changed the way I thought. But somewhere in the library, I came across a book that suggested that The Inner Game of Tennis was a terrific book for getting better at playing pool. And so I bought it. And they were right. The Inner Game of Tennis is a terrific book about getting better at anything. And the reason is, is because it's not about the techniques of getting better. It's about the mindset and the physicality of learning. So uh, the origin story, if I remember correctly, in Tim Galloway's book was that he was, he was a tennis pro and taught. And he had somebody who was very new and they were having trouble understanding what he was saying about returning a serve. And so he said, oh, or maybe about just serving, right? And 
he said, okay, instead of trying to do all the things I'm telling you to do, try and clear your mind, he said, and just watch me do it. Watch me do it and threw up them all, sent a couple home, threw up the ball, sent a couple home. And this student threw up the ball and served a beautiful serve after watching him a few times. And what he said that he understood was, there's a way in which we can open ourselves up to the physical intuition of doing something if we're paying attention. And it's about more than just trying to log all the specific details and build this little brick wall of details that you've got to remember when you're doing something. It's funny because Freud talked about when Freud was effectively inventing therapy, uh, one of the things he said to, a ther said to potential therapists was, don't try and remember everything everybody is saying in a session. Try and get yourself to this place of reception where what you're hearing what's going on, but you're trying not to form opinions about it. You're trying not to store it in special places. You're just letting it come to you. And then courses of action become apparent. So Tim Gallery spends the whole book sort of explaining to you how to get to this state of physical intuition with the, with the sport that you're playing. In, in tennis, he calls it falling in love with the ball. That in tennis, you're the whole reason you're playing it is because of that ball, right? That ball is the thing you move. It's the thing you keep score with. And it can be your best friend or it can be your worst enemy. Neither of those matter as long as you're in love with it. And I was able to transfer that kind of thinking of like falling in love with that thing to the cue ball, to, to playing pool and to the, to the table, to looking at a table and understanding a, 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 an eight ball table or a nine ball table as a gesture of moves rather than as a set of specific actions. And that was the loveliest moment that happened to me while playing pool was I started to, I eventually got to a place where, yeah, the, the, the table was more of a gesture than a set of moves. All of that knowledge is gone. I haven't played seriously in 30 years. Uh, I still play occasionally. My sons, I think, are both better pool players than I am now, which is a freaking delight the inner game of tennis. Um, that is definitely a book that changed the way I thought. A um, Hundred Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. That book changed what I thought literature could be like. I, and I mean, a, a reasonable American high school education could, could ruin anybody's love of literature, uh, to be totally clear. Uh, it is a, it is a, it can be a really difficult slog to work your way through the pearl or the grapes of wrath under the, under the, the guise of our educational system. Um, and I can't even remember what made me pick up a hundred years of solitude, except I think it was in my parents' house. And I, uh, uh, in the house I grew up in, there was a downstairs bathroom that was also like a library. And so when you stood there peeing, there was like books on all three sides of you and hundred years of solitude was like right in the center. And I remember, picking it up and reading the thoughts of a man who is about to be executed by firing squad. That is the opening paragraph. And I thought, that is far out. And the book really rocked me. It is, there's a reason it won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, <clears throat> and it's, it, for, for the longest time, weirdly, both Jamie Heineman and I both said that that was maybe our all time favorite book. I'm not sure that it isn't, but I just haven't been asked that question in a long time, so I haven't really thought about it. Um, I also had my mind changed a lot about the nature of reality by reading some of Carlos Castaneda. Now, before you get your hackles up, I understand that he is not an anthropologist and those books that Castaneda wrote are not anthropology, but they are beautiful allegories. They are beautiful allegories about consciousness and about the nature of being and the nature of being a human being with other human beings. Um, I mean, there's seven or eight of the Carlos Castaneda books. I'd suggest you read them in order, in the order in which they were written, because they are a kind of a, of a journey. Uh, and I found them really powerful. They still stick with me. Weirdly enough, Jamie Heineman also read all those books in high school. Yeah, we have a really, really similar reading history. It's hard to fathom. Um, other books that totally changed the way I thought. Uh, Noam Chomsky. Uh, famous linguist, famous political activist. Um, Chomsky's right. That's all you need to know. Chomsky's right. You may agree with him or disagree with him. It doesn't matter. He's a scientist and he's pretty much right. Uh, I was radicalized by Chomsky early on and 
I mean, like at 18 or 19, and here I am at 53, my eyes are still being opened in ways that he was banging the drum about 30, 40 years ago. Uh, his analysis of American foreign policy is amazing and straight up the middle, it's right on the money. Um, and it paints a pretty bleak picture. And here we are reaping the rewards of this bleak, of this bleak picture. But I didn't talk about this to get into politics. I just, you asked me books that changed my mind. These are some of them. I'm trying to think of, uh, I never knew I could read a book as long as the three books for Lord of the Rings until I read them at 14 or 15. Those definitely, that was definitely a thing, but as far as like really changing the way that I thought they, 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 they weren't, they weren't, that wasn't, that wasn't my origin story there. I know it's a lot of people's, but it wasn't. Um, I feel like there's one other that I am missing. There is a book called, this is super esoteric, The Brutality of Fact. And it is a set of interviews. Uh, the interviewer is British art critic David Sylvester, and the interviewee is uh, British artist Francis Bacon. And Bacon is a very complicated guy. He's in many ways, a ter terrible human being. I mean, uh, in, uh, reportedly, I don't know him personally. I've never met. I never met him. Um, one of my all-time favorite painters. Truly, a, I mean, one of the darkest, weirdest, most disturbing painters. But in these interviews, he has a way of talking about art and talking about, and using words to talk about art like truth. That are, you wanna talk about art and you wanna talk about truth, you better be really, really specific because those words can get spongy in a hurry and everyone can have different ideas about what they mean. But he has a specificity of language in this book that I found slayed me in my early 20s. I still have this book. I still refer to it from time to time. I actually read it in its entirety in preparation for writing my book because there was some specific aspects about things he'd said. Oh, one other book. Yes, I knew there was one that was really important. Okay, this one requires a little backstory. Um, back in the mid 80s, Rebox had a ad that said, Rebox, let you be you. Rebox, let you be you. And, uh, and it literally it said, Reeboks let you be. You be you. You be you. Which is significant. Because if you've studied early 20th century art history, you know about Per Ubu. The first time anyone cursed on a stage. Per Ubu is this surrealist masterpiece set of plays that were sending up uh, the, the class, the French class system. It's a whole thing. So I was like, wow. And I was looking into art history at the time and studying it on my own. And Ubu, Ubu, Ooh, okay, Ubu as a advertising, that's kind of interesting. But then that's not what grabbed me. What grabbed me was that these commercials had all these phrases in them. Whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. There comes a time in everyone's life when they discover that envy is ignorance. To know that what is true in your secret heart is true for all, that is genius. And it was all against footage of people wearing Reeboks. But these phrases, like, they rocked me. And they stuck with me. And a couple of years after this ad campaign came out, I was working on an animated commercial for somebody. And... I ended up meeting the two ad execs who wrote this campaign. And I said, hey, where did you get those phrases? Cause like I used to compile Bartlett's quotations for a local public access channel and I've never seen any of those and they really killed me. And they're like, oh, we just found them in certain places. They were all like gee willikers about it. Well, here's the thing. They were slow playing me. All of the phrases from the Reebok commercials came from a book by Ralph Waldo Emerson called Self-Reliance. And it is a really, really super important book. And because the, all of those phrases are held within it. And it is about taking your own counsel about the things that you see and speaking the truth to yourself about what they are rather than what you think others' truth might be. He has this part of like, imagine taking on somebody else's opinion about something. Like you see something and you realize, you think, ah, my opinion is not good enough. I'm going to take their opinion. You take their opinion, you express it. And then somebody says to you the truth about the thing, 
with a great good nature and you have the shame of taking your opinion from another. He says this specifically in the book. This is a shame I know deeply. Oh man, that book just like, it cracked open my skull in terms of listening to your own counsel. And that is really, I think, essentially what the, what the book is about. It's, it's, pub, it's in the public domain. If you search Self-Reliance by Ralph Waldo Emerson, you can totally find it. Um, oh, now I'm on a roll because th now there's Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by Robert Piercing, which is a terrific book that taught me a lot about the nature of quality and the intersection of things. Um, Self-reliance. Uh, no, I, I think that's about it. I think that's about as far as I could go right now. There is a few more subtitles in there, but those are the definitely the highlights. Thank you. This is one of the longer Q and A's I've ever done on a single question. We'll include links to all these books in the comments below. Uh, and, uh, ah, I'm so sorry. I have one more. Letters to a Young Poet by Rainer Maria Rilke. Uh, that is another book that totally changed my world when I read it. Uh, on the nature of creativity and your emotional landscape. Yeah, that's a nice little, for me, that's what I got out of Letters to a Young Poet. Uh, there's a specific translation that I prefer over any other, and I will make sure that that translation is the one we link to in the comments. Thank you, as always, for such great questions, and I will see you next time.